My name is Ramaya Krishnan. I'm the interim dean of the, of the Heinz School of Public Policy and Management. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this Heinz Talks event. Uh, we are delighted, delighted and honored to host this event um, in conjunction with the presentation of this year's Heinz Awards, uh, which is really a, a very important occasion both in Pittsburgh and in the nation. The award honors the achievement of some impressive individuals who have made a huge difference in their chosen field or community. And it's really quite uh, a wonderful and humbling experience for me and for everybody involved to hear about uh, the wonderful things that these people have accomplished. I'm especially pleased uh, to welcome Teresa Hines, uh, who's here to listen to a discussion on a subject which she cares deeply about and has an abiding and well-informed interest in. <clears throat> it's a subject which most of us are deeply concerned about as well. The task of the panel today, as you know, is to give advice on climate change and energy policy to the winner of the U.S. presidential election. It's very likely that we will see some significant efforts and changes in policy in this area, at least I hope so. Um, this panel will provide some thoughtful discussion of this topic, which is certainly going to play an important role in our national and global future. It now gives me great pleasure um, to introduce our moderator of this evening's event, Dr. Dr. Moira Gunn. Uh, among other things, she's actually, while at NASA, worked on climate change models. Uh, Dr. Gunn is uh, the host of Tech Nation and Biotech Nation, which air in such venues as uh, the National Public Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio Channels, uh, NPR Now, NPR Talk, and internationally to 175 countries via the uh, Armed Forces, uh, the American Forces Radio International. Tech Nation is the sole national weekly radio program on the impact of technology and its weekly Biotech Nation segment enjoys the same status in the area of biotech issues. The intriguing story of building Biotech Nation, uh, building the Biotech Nation segment, and the leading issues facing us all in this arena is described in our book, Welcome to Biotech Nation, My Unexpected Odyssey into the Land of Small Molecules, Lean Genes, and Big Ideas. Uh, it is named to the best science books of 2007 by the American Library Association. So without further ado, Dr. Myra Gunn. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am delighted to be here. And yes, I am the host of Tech Nation and Biotech Nation. And several people stopped me out in the in the hallway and they said, you know, I listen to you on podcasts while, while I'm working out. And I think if, if uh, CMU can just get its science going so I can passively benefit from the calorie burning activity. <laughs> I would really be appreciative. And so for those people who do listen, um, I've already had a couple of requests. I'm going to do it for everybody at the same time. It's the opening line of the show. From San Francisco, I'm Moira Gunn, and this is Tech Nation. Now, it, it, my first duty here is a distinct pleasure. It's to introduce Teresa Hines. And in so many wa ways, of course, Teresa needs no introduction. Of course, she is here today as the chairman of the Hines Family Philanthropies and the Hines Endowment. Endowments. Germane to our topic, which is climate change and en energy policy advice to our next president, Teresa has worked diligently on behalf of environmental and ecological causes. This includes the establishment of the Heinz Awards, which includes a specific recognition for the environment. A mere few examples of her personal efforts include being a member of the official U.S. delegation to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Brazil in 1992, since 1995, she has sponsored the annual conference on women's health and the environment, 
Mrs. Hines has sponsored such media productions as the Environ Minute and the World Eco Minute, reaching citizens in more than 100 countries, as well as the PBS-produced Health Week. She serves on the Advisory Council for the Center for Children's Health and the Environment at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And with her husband, Senator John Kerry, she has co-written the book, This Moment on Earth. Of this book, the National Geographic wrote, This Moment on Earth makes demands on its readers holding all of us accountable for the environmental implications of every decision, whether in Congress, in state and local government, or in business. As they say, this is the moment not just to talk about the planet, but to save it. Now, this is certainly the committed and public face of Teresa Hines, but as a journalist, as someone who interviews people for a living, we always want to know, who is this person really? And so, first thing journalists do is they piece together everything, the resumes and the background, and it doesn't take too long before you realize, you know, at some point, someone always comments, isn't that a record? Isn't she the only woman married to two U.S. senators? Could this possibly? Has anybody done it before? Well, I'm reminded of Mrs. Jonas Salk. I happen to be standing next to her, and a wildly overenthusiastic uh, journalist was standing in front of her and said, Why, Mrs. Salk, not only are you married to the great man Jonas Salk, but in fact, your first hus husband was Pablo Picasso. That is just incredible. And he went on and on. And finally, she said, you find that interesting? And he goes, I find that wildly interesting. She said, you find it interesting that lions sleep with lions? <laughs> Let me assure you, Teresa Hines is indeed a lion. And I knew it when I met her face to face for the first time. We go by that. Uh, in journalism. We go by that certainly at NPR where we see what used to be called the measure of the man and now we say the measure of the person because you learn so much meeting them in person. She has a particular quality that I don't see very often and I saw it the very first moment. Uh, the last time I saw I was thinking I've got to give you an example, just not give it a name. The last time I saw it, I saw it about a year ago when uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus walked into my studio. He, of course, is the, the economist who was the founder of Grameen Bank. He brought millions out of poverty and he shared with the Grameen Bank the Nobel Pre Peace Prize. There is a Nobel Prize in economics, isn't there, Lee? Yeah, well... Whatever. <laughs> it was a really great idea. But the truth is, is that he walked into the studio and immediately you could feel the goodness. Goodness coming out of every pore. That is what he is about. And it was the same quality that I encountered the very first time that I met Teresa Hines. The goodness was palpable. And everything she's done, everything she does and has ever since, everything we're even doing here today. So please join me in welcoming to the stage... Teresa Hines. Thank you. I should have flown in like an angel. <laughs> thank you so much, Mora. And thank you for being here, all of you, to hear a distinguished panel and to hear John Holdren. It's a great pleasure to introduce John, who's a professor, a researcher, an educator, and a friend of many years, who has been involved in many of the most sensitive and complex climate, energy, and nuclear arms issues for more than three decades. Dr. Holdren is the first recipient of the Teresa and John Hines III Chair in Environmental Policy at Harvard School Kennedy School of Government, and he concurrently serves as the director of the Woods Hole Research Center. Interestingly, um, this chair was created soon after my husband died in 91, uh, and there was no one to fill it for quite a while. And it was a chair that hoped to bring together no, it wasn't 91. 91 was at the Harvard Business School to, to bridge business and public policy. So there was a chair in either in both of the schools. And I had nothing to do with John's appointment 
It was a surprise for me at the, when he was finally stolen from Berkeley to Harvard. And they said, we have a dean, I mean a dean, a, a professor for your chair. And they told me it was John. And I was bowled over. And I know my husband would have been bowled over. So he is that kind of a person who just everything he touches is, um, he's in a sense blessed, except he hasn't been able to do anything about global climate change yet. But he will. <laughs> he will. Um, he traces his interest in energy and arms control back to a book he read while still in high school, Harrison Brown's The Challenge of Man's Future, which made the case that problems of popul uh, population, food and energy, mineral resources and economic development and international security are not independent but intimately intertwined, so that solutions for all of them must be pursued in parallel. Then a young Holdren was persuaded and decided that these interlocking interdisciplinary problems of the human condition pose the most interesting and important challenges facing the modern world. He has been a member since 1973 of the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs, an international group of scholars and public figures who meet regularly to discuss ways to reduce the dangers from weapons of mass destruction and to build international cooperation on other common problems. John has served as the chairman of the executive committee of Pugwash Conference from 1987 to 1997 uh, and was chosen by his colleagues to give the acceptance speech when the organization shared the Nobel Prize in 1995. World leaders continuously seek Dr. Holdren's expertise and he has been appointed to numerous national and international committees to evaluate energy strategies global environmental problems, and arms control. From 94 to 2000, Dr. Holdren served as the President Clinton's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology, known as PCAST. Dr. Holdren chaired the first study request from PCAST, which led to a 95 Presidential Decision Directive, revising U.S. policy on cooperation with Russia on nuclear materials uh, protection. Also in the mid-90s, he co-chaired the National Academy of Sciences' reshaping of the United States policy on the management of this country's weapons-grade plutonium. And from 1995 to 1999, he chaired a series of PCAST studies on revising U.S. energy research strategy to more effectively address the challenges of the 21st century, including especially the challenge of global climate change. John Holdren is that rare scientist who is able to translate his research into meaningful public policy. He has applied his interdisciplinary skills and expertise in his and his extraordinary intellect to improving policies governing nuclear arms control, climate change, global environmental degradation, and resource conservation. Simply put, our world today is safer and better off than it would have been absent his contributions. He is joined by his wife, Dr. Sherry Holdren, who is a self-distinguished scientist and a friend too. And I welcome you, John, to our town. Well, thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, I'm going to start with some remarks on the scientific dimension of the challenges we face in relation to energy and climate. And that will set the stage, I think, for remarks to follow by Professor Granger Morgan and Professor Lee Branstetter on technological and economic and public policy dimensions of this question, and then comments by uh, a Heinz School a Master of Science student, Melissa Young, uh, who will comment, I think, on the whole uh, array of, uh, of issues that confront us in this domain. All of this uh, under the title of Advice on Energy and Climate Change uh, for the Next President. Uh, I would start by saying that the single most important thing that the next President of the United States needs to understand about the energy climate challenge 
is that that challenge is not less important than the economy. It is not less important than national security. It is intertwined with those other crucial ingredients of our well-being and in a very fundamental way. The essence of the matter is this. Without energy, there is no economy. Without climate, there is no environment. Without economy and environment, there is no material well-being, there is no civil society, there is no personal security or national security or international security. And the essence of the problem is that the world has long been getting the energy that its economy needs from burning fossil fuels that have been releasing greenhouse gases, destroying the climate that its environment needs. Compounding that predicament, tropical developing countries have been busy chewing up their rainforests under a misguided economics that mistakes consumption of environmental capital for income, that adds more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than all of the cars, trucks, buses, trains, and airplanes in the world, and that is rapidly depleting the greatest storehouse of biodiversity on the planet. This has all got to be fixed, and it's got to be fixed fast. Global warming, the next president also needs to understand, is a misnomer. It's a wholly misleading term whose popular use as a description of what's happening to the climate has probably delayed the appropriate sense of urgency by a decade or more. The word global suggests something that's uniform across the planet, and warming suggests that it's mainly about temperature, that it's happening gradually, and for many might even be welcome. The reality is different. What's happening is highly non-uniform geographically with the largest amounts of heating taking place mid-continent and in the far north. It's not just about temperature, but about humidity, soil moisture, patterns of precipitation, storm tracks, ocean currents, and all the other phenomena that constitute climate. The changes are not gradual, but rapid by the two standards that matter the most, rapid compared to the rate at which ecosystems can adapt, and rapid compared to the rate at which human societies can adapt. And while these changes in climate might benefit some people in some places for some period of time, for most people in most places, and starting sooner rather than later, the changes are going to entrain far more harm than good. Rather than calling it global warming, we should be calling it global climate disruption. The year-round globally average surface temperature of the Earth which climatologists track as an index of the state of the climate, is going up. The Earth is heating up, albeit in fits and starts because of the complexity of the interacting natural and human influences upon it. But it's important to understand that the change in that index, the change in the global average surface temperature, does not in itself constitute a description of the associated disruption. The Earth's surface temperature as an index of the state of the climate is like the temperature of your body as an index of how the bodily machinery is working. In both cases, relatively small changes in the index correspond to big changes in the condition of the system. If your body temperature goes up 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, that is 3 degrees Celsius, from 98.6 Fahrenheit to 104 Fahrenheit, that reflects complex and dangerous disruptions going on in your body. Everybody understands that. Everybody understands that that sort of increase in body temperature calls for consulting a physician and quickly. Well, the average surface temperature of the Earth is a similarly sensitive indicator. An increase of 3 degrees Celsius, 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, would be associated with profound changes in climatic patterns. It would correspond to a severe fever of the earth, and it calls for consulting specialists and doing something about it. Illustrative of this, we know that the difference in global average surface temperature between an ice age 
and the sort of warm interglacial that we've been enjoying for about the last 12,000 years is just five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit. And in fact, with the average surface temperature having risen now in the last hundred years, only about eight tenths of a degree Celsius, 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, we are already observing substantial disruption of climatic patterns from their long-term norms. The science relating to the main features of this phenomenon is about as unequivocal as science gets. It's not only telling us that the disruption is real and that it's caused mostly by humans rather than by natural climatic variation, it's also telling us that the disruption is already creating significant harm to the well-being of societies and ecosystems across the planet, and it's telling us that the disruption is accelerating and the harm escalating faster than seemed plausible to almost anybody a decade ago or even five years ago. Civilization's emissions of carbon dioxide are growing faster than the highest growth scenarios that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put forth in 2001. The carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere is likewise rising faster than projected, due both to the rising emissions and to apparent slowdowns in the uptake of part of the carbon dioxide in the oceans and in northern forests and soils. The rates of increase of temperature and sea level are at the high end of the ranges of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2001 projections. Sea level is now increasing at twice the average rate that it did in the 20th century. The floating sea ice that covers most of the Arctic Ocean, which a few years ago experts thought might disappear by 2070 in a steadily heating world, has been shrinking so rapidly that the same experts now say it could be gone by 2013 or 2015. As for escalating harm to human well-being, the harm that is already occurring, floods, droughts, heat waves, and wildfires have all been increasing in the respective parts of the world already prone to those syndromes and in patterns that climate change models predicted would result from greenhouse gas-induced climatic disruption. Changes in the monsoons in India and China are already impacting food production in both of those countries. Tropical pathogens are expanding their ranges, their geographic ranges, and pest outbreaks tied to altered climatic conditions are ravaging both temperate and boreal forests. The formerly moist tropical forests, rainforests, that were once too wet to burn, are now a fire every two or three years, destroying timber and launching more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to amplify the greenhouse effect. The world's coral reefs are being poached in the warming surface seas, and they're being pickled by increased acidity caused when some of the atmosphere's excess carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater and forms carbonic acid. Livelihoods dependent on the coral reefs, the second greatest reservoir of biodiversity on the planet after the tropical forests, are at risk. The evidence is strong that the intensifying warming of surface waters is also intensifying the most severe tropical storms, the ones we call typhoons in the western Pacific and hurricanes in the eastern Pacific and in the Atlantic. The World Health Organization, not prone to exaggeration in these matters, estimated in 2002 that climate change was killing upwards of 150,000 people per year already in the year 2000. The casualties of increased floods, droughts, heat waves, and the climate-related growth of tropical diseases. The World Health Organization is working on an estimate for 2005, which will undoubtedly be higher than the 150,000 per year it estimated for 2000. And we're heading for worse. Without sharp changes in civilization's trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions from the energy system and from tropical deforestation, the global average surface temperature is going to soar from eight-tenths of a degree above the 1750 level in 2005 to two degrees Celsius above in 2050 and three degrees Celsius above in 2100. The last time the world was as warm as we're headed for being in 2050, was 130,000 years ago, and sea level then was four to six meters, that is 13 to 20 feet, higher than it is today. 
The last time the world was as warm as we're headed for being in 2100, if we don't change course, was 30 million years ago in the Eocene, when my Harvard colleague Dan Schrag likes to say there were crocodiles swimming off of Greenland and palm trees in Wyoming, and sea level then was 20 to 30 meters, that is 66 to 98 feet higher than sea level is today. Now it takes centuries for sea level to reach equilibrium with higher temperatures, but nobody knows how many centuries. Our models are still inadequate to reflect the processes that can produce rapid disintegration of the great ice sheets on Antarctica and Greenland, and we simply do not know how fast sea level could rise. We do know that rates of increase as high as two to five meters per century have accompanied natural warming periods in the past, and that should be scary. Facing this situation, society has only three options. Mitigation, the measures you take to reduce the pace and the magnitude of the climate changes that occur. Adaptation, the measures you take to reduce the impacts of climate changes that you fail to avoid. Things like developing heat-resistant, drought-resistant, and salt-resistant crops, building more dams and dikes, changing habitation patterns to move away from seacoasts, and so on. And the third option, we have to be clear about this, is suffering. Those are the three. Mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We're already doing some of all three. We're doing some mitigation, we're doing some adaptation, and we're doing some suffering. What's up for grabs in this issue is the future mix of those. How much mitigation, how much adaptation, and how much suffering. We know we can't rely on mitigation alone because climate change is already well underway and nothing we do can stop it in its tracks. We can't rely on adaptation alone because adaptation gets more difficult, more costly, and less effective the bigger are the changes in climate to which you're trying to adapt. How does a low-lying island state adapt to two meters of sea level rise? That's not adaptation, it's evacuation. What we need to do is to apply enough mitigation to avoid climatic changes too large to adapt to. This was summarized in the subtitle of a UN report with which I was associated on climate change and sustainable development. The subtitle was Avoiding the Unmanageable and Managing the Unavoidable. Avoiding the unmanageable, that's mitigation. Managing the unavoidable, that's adaptation. And to the extent we fail to do enough of both, make no mistake, we will suffer. With respect to the question of how much mitigation is needed and how fast in order to avoid the unmanageable, it's important to note that the official goal of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, to which the United States and 190 other countries are parties, was to avoid dangerous human interference in the climate system. And the sad news is that goal is already out of reach. It is already lost because by any reasonable definition of the word dangerous, we are already experiencing dangerous human interference in the climate system. If 150,000 excess deaths per year in the year 2000 was not already dangerous, I don't know what is. The question before us now is whether we can avoid catastrophic human interference in the climate system. The best chance for doing that requires stabilizing the sum of all the human influences on the atmosphere at the equivalent of 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide or less. To do that requires that the overall emissions of greenhouse gases and other climate-altering substances worldwide need to peak no later than 2020 and be declining thereafter. Allowing a reasonable amount of additional growth in the developing countries means that the industrialized nations must level off their greenhouse gas emissions and begin to decline no later than about 2015 so that the developing countries can have until about 2025 to level off and begin to decline. And it's important to understand some of the dynamics of this problem that make it so difficult one can summarize some of those difficult dynamics by pointing out that stabilizing emissions 
does not stop the growth of concentrations. If we leveled off emissions where they are today, the concentrations in the atmosphere would continue to rise. Stabilizing concentrations doesn't stop the growth of temperature. Because after you stabilize concentrations, it takes the oceans decades to catch up with the changes you've imposed on the atmosphere. We are already experiencing today only something in the range of 60% of the temperature increase that would ultimately be associated with what we have already done to the atmosphere. If we could stop the rise of concentration instantaneously, temperatures would coast up about another half a degree Celsius. And finally, stabilizing temperature doesn't stop the growth of the damages. After you stabilize temperature at a higher value, the ice will continue to melt for thousands of years, continuing to raise sea level. So there are huge time lags built into the response of the system. And we further have to confront the time lags in the human system, the energy system, which is responsible for a large fraction of the emissions that are altering our climate, is very expensive, very large, very slow to change. Today's energy system represents in the world an investment of about $15 trillion in capital. That's what it would cost you to replace all the power plants, oil refineries, pipelines, transmission lines, drilling rigs in the world. $15 trillion. And that $15 trillion investment, which by the way, is today 80% in fossil fuel energy systems and technologies. 80% of the world's energy comes from coal, oil, and natural gas. For all you hear about nuclear energy and solar and geothermal, 80% coming from coal, oil, and natural gas, 80% in round numbers of that $15 trillion investment is tied up in the technologies that are wrecking the climate, and that investment ordinarily turns over in about 40 years. That's the average lifetime of a power plant, an oil refinery, and what have you. If you want the energy system in 2050 to look very different from the energy system today, you've got to start changing it now. The other big component of the problem, deforestation, is also hard to change. Deforestation is driven by forces that are deeply embedded in the economics of development, of timber, of fuel, of trade. We can't change it overnight, no matter what we do, but change it, we must. So what do we need to do? What does the next president need to be thinking about in terms of what needs to be done? This is largely going to be addressed by my colleagues. I love it when I lay out a difficult problem and then say my colleagues will give you the answer. Uh, I will say a few quick things about what is needed and then leave them to flesh it out. Number one, there are some win-win solutions out there, things we can do that address climate change but also make money or address other development goals, reduce conventional pollution, reduce oil dependence, and so on. Those so-called win-win solutions are not being embraced at the pace they ought to be because there are a variety of barriers out there to embracing them, perverse incentives. Uh, subsidies of the wrong things, tax incentives that go in the wrong direction, and so on. We need to knock those barriers down. Secondly, we need to put a price on greenhouse gas emissions. We need to make it expensive to put these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This is probably the single most important thing we can do. We could do it with a cap-and-trade approach. We could do it with a tax. One way or the other, we have to make it expensive. Third, we have to apply some supplementary measures to the price on greenhouse gas emissions to deal with particularly difficult sectors, with coal-fired electricity generation, to create incentives large enough that coal-fired power plants will capture their carbon dioxide rather than emitting it to the atmosphere and sequester it away from the atmosphere. We need to increase investments in energy technology research development and demonstration by several fold in the public sector, and we need to increase the incentives for private sector research to improve energy technologies that we will need to address these challenges in a cost-effective way. I sometimes say that the things we can do that are win-win that already make money are like the low-hanging fruit, but we need energy research and development to lower some of the higher-hanging fruit and bring it into reach. And we need a price on greenhouse gas emissions to motivate reaching higher into the tree. We need to expand partnerships, public, private, and international, for deploying advanced energy technologies because this is a problem that has to be solved everywhere, not just in a few countries, but all around the world. And we need to achieve a new global agreement 
for mitigation and adaptation in the post-2012 period aimed at declining global emissions by 2020 and including compensation to tropical forest nations for not cutting down their forests. If we don't pay them to not cut down their forests, they're all going to be cut down. And so on that happy note, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to give you the details of how we're going to fix this. And then uh, our student member will respond with cries of outrage that we created such a mess for her generation to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John Holdren. Thank you very much. Now, our, our next fixer, put in the fix here. Now, our next fixer is Dr. Granger Morgan. He's professor and head of the Department of Engineering and Public Policy here at CMU, where he's also university and Lord Chair Professor in Engineering. In addition, he holds academic appointments in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and in the H. John Hines III School of Public Policy and Management. His research addresses problems in science, technology, and public policy with a particular focus on energy, environmental systems, climate change, and risk analysis. At Carnegie Mellon, Dr. Morgan directs the National Science Foundation's Climate Decision-Making Center and co-directs the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center. He served as chair of the Science Advisory Board of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and as chair of the Advisory Council of the Electrical Power Research Institute. Among his distinctions, Dr. Morgan is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Granger Morgan. Thanks very much. Well, um, John told you that energy is a big part of the problem, and so I'm going to talk a bit about how we might begin to reduce uh, carbon emissions from the energy system. In fact, we have to reduce them by something like 80% or more because unlike uh, conventional pollutants, sulfur dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, which stay in the atmosphere for just a few hours or a day or two, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for as much as a century or more, and so it's like a big bathtub. It's as though we had an enormous faucet and a relatively small drain, and unless we close the faucet down dramatically, the bathtub is just going to continue to fill up. So we've got to figure out how do we close that faucet, uh, and energy is a big part of the answer. Now, energy is, in fact, energy systems are the largest source of carbon dioxide, just under 40% comes from generating electricity, about 30% comes from transportation, and buildings, which of course overlap those two, uh, constitute about half of all CO2 emissions. So that tells us where to focus. I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about using electricity more efficiently. I'm going to talk about making sure that new buildings are much more energy efficient. I'm going to talk about converting to carbon-free electricity, and I'm going to wrap up with a word or two about reducing emissions from motor vehicles. So let's start with energy efficiency. First thing to note is that this doesn't mean that we have to suffer. I mean, it does mean we have to use less energy, but we can get the goods and services that we're used to if we're smart uh, and we uh, uh, use energy more effectively. The best way to demonstrate that, for starters, is to look at a country like Denmark. I don't know how many of you have been in Denmark, but, you know, life there is not that tough. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uses dramatically more energy, both per person and per GDP, than Denmark. Denmark uses about 45% as much energy per person, about 50% as much energy per GDP produced. So that's one example that says we can, there's a long way we could go uh, by simply adopting some of the things that others around the world are already doing. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first one is appliance standards. Now, back in the 1970s, uh, a, an average refrigerator was 18 cubic feet. Today it's 22 cubic feet. That's a 22% increase in size. Uh, back then it cost about $1,000. Uh, today it costs $460. That's about a 55% decrease in cost. Now here's the zinger. Today, 
refrigerators use 68% less electricity than they did back in the 70s. Why? Because of appliance standards, first developed in California and then subsequently adopted uh, at a national level. So we could do the same sort of thing for lots of other technologies like the big flat screen uh, TVs that are power hogs, uh, power supplies and lots of other things uh, and so on. There's many opportunities for appliance standards that we have not yet uh, used. Lighting uses about 20% of all electric power, and new solid-state lighting that uses LEDs, light-emitting diodes, is just under 10 times as much as efficient in terms of the amount of light produced as incandescent bulbs. Uh, and it, it does, at the moment, about as well as fluorescence, but unlike fluorescence, which aren't getting substantially more efficient, solid-state lighting is rapidly getting more efficient. Now, it is more expensive at this stage, um, but the problem with incandescent bulbs is that while they're cheap, they don't last very long. A few hundred to a few thousand hours solid state light lasts 30,000 to 50,000 hours. So once you bought one, you pretty much got it forever. And in life cycle terms, with commercial discount rates, solid state lighting is already a good buy, policies that could be put in place could promote this in residential and uh, 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 other sectors as well. And the last thing I want to talk about on, on the efficiency front is per capita use across the country. Now, the U.S. has seen constant growth in per capita uh, electricity consumption, actually linear, not exponential, but still it's been growing. In contrast, for the past 20 years or so, California and New York have been flat in terms of per capita consumption of electricity. And Vermont has actually seen slightly falling per capita uh, consumption. Now, why? It's not because they were just sitting back and doing nothing. All three of those states have had aggressive programs to promote a wide range of efficient uh, technologies. Uh, Vermont, for example, skims a little bit of money off every kilowatt hour sold, puts it into a pool, which is then used to promote all kinds of energy efficient activities all around the state. So that's the first topic, energy efficiency. The second topic I'll be briefer about, this is new buildings. My colleague Lester Lave tells me that new, uh, both commercial and residential buildings could be 70 to 80 percent more energy efficient than current standard buildings. And he points to examples of homes in California and Florida where some were made energy efficient, some were pretty standard, and in fact that is the kind of difference that's being observed. Now, you know, there may be some behavioral differences. Presumably the people who bought the energy efficient buildings were also, look, you know, they were conscious of this issue. But, but the bottom line is that we could have dramatic impacts. How? Well, with various building codes and standards uh, that insist that we, for example, use two by six rather than two by four construction, that we use good insulation and so on. Third thing I want to talk about is converting to clean sources of electricity. Now everybody talks about solar, and solar thermal for water heating can be cost effective today, and in some parts of the US, solar thermal for electricity is getting pretty cost effective. Unfortunately, solar photovoltaics, or PV, is at least six times too expensive. And in a recent study we did, uh, Amy Cordwright, who's sitting out here, and I did, with 18 leading PV experts, it looks like it's going to be many decades before it's going to become cost effective for bulk power electricity, even in places like electricity. Uh, we need to spend money on research, that is, on improving the efficiency of cells, on power electronics, on batteries. But it probably doesn't make sense to pour great gobs of public money into deploring are deploying the current uh, generation of technology because the learning curves are just not steep enough. We can talk more about that during the discussion session if you're interested, but in contrast to solar, wind is today quite cost competitive with other sources of carbon-free energy. And the main problem, of course, with both wind and solar power is that it's intermittent. And to cover the gaps, we're going to need something else. Typically these days that means gas turbines, and when they get cycled up and down, they produce CO2, but they also produce lots of NOx. New Jersey is a good example. New Jersey has a renewable portfolio standard that's going to require a significant amount of renewables. The obvious thing to put in is uh, wind, 
but uh, New Jersey also has a serious Knox problem. And so this problem can get solved, but to date, uh, the folks who design turbines have not really given it the attention it deserves. And I want to wrap up this section on renewables with a warning. It's really important to do analysis before setting targets. Pennsylvania's politicians have implemented a requirement for 800 megawatts of solar PV. And my colleague Jay Apt has estimated that between now and the year 2020, that's going to cost Pennsylvania ratepayers $1.8 billion more than the same amount of wind. And then after that, about $400 million every year thereafter. So while renewables can help, they aren't going to get us to the 80% reduction by mid-century that uh, uh, John talked about and that I uh, endorse. And that means uh, we're going to look for other things. Nuclear is great, but nuclear is only 20% of current generation. My own view is that we'll be really lucky if we can keep it at that fraction because there are lots of problems, as we all know, in siting and build, building new nuclear plants. Today, just over half of our electricity comes from coal. The fraction bounces a bit. Uh, and coal, as it's used today, is dirty, nasty stuff, given the way it's mined and used. But I don't see any other way to get an 80% reduction without substantial use of coal with carbon capture and sequestration. That is the notion that either before or after you burn the stuff, you capture the carbon dioxide, you put it a kilometer or more underground in a, in a, a secure reservoir where it will stay more or less indefinitely. Now, we've done in my department a lot of technical work on this. If you're interested, we also have a couple million dollar effort going on right now on developing a regulatory framework for CCS. It's really easy to remember how to go see it. It's www.ccsreg.org. The bottom line is there are no magic bullets. It's going to take everything we got in terms of decarbonizing the electricity system. So how fast could we do it and what might it cost? A couple of years ago for the Pew Center, we did a, an analysis of the electricity system. If you doubled the rate at which we now build new plants and you only put in carbon-free generation, we would completely decarbonize the electricity system in about 50 years. And you say, wow, but isn't that going to be enormously expensive? Yeah, it'll be expensive, and if you do it overnight, of course, it'll break the bank. But if you do it in the sort of orderly way I just described, uh, the cost will be about comparable to what it costs this industry to meet the requirements of the Clean Air Act. You know, everybody said meeting the Clean Air Act is going to wreck the economy. It didn't. And in my view, decarbonizing the electricity system will also uh, be entirely manageable if we get started now and we do it in a systematic, orderly way. Last thing I want to say just a word or two about is transportation. Now, the obvious way to deal with emissions from motor vehicles is to dramatically improve gas mileage. And we've had in this country for quite a few years this initiative, Freedom Car, that promised a hydrogen future. They sort of held this mirage out there on the horizon. My own view is that that was basically a strategy to allow the auto industry not to do anything, not to do all the things that we technically knew how to do by promising this wonderful future. Well, of course, it hasn't turned out that way, and now we're stuck with uh, a fleet that's, that's still using lots and lots of gasoline, much more than, ought to be, uh, than it ought to use, uh, given the technologies we have in hand. Ethanol from corn is basically just a giant farm subsidy program. Biomass fuels from cellulose, things like switchgrass, wood chips, and so on, uh, and maybe also from trash, may be able to play a role, but the indirect impacts on food prices and on land use are still only now being understood and, and in my view, probably uh, going to be a serious limit. Hybrids can help, uh, but uh, they are uh, uh, only a part of the solution. Smaller, lighter uh, cars and much more efficient uh, conventional gas engines clearly are needed. And plug electric hybrids may be useful, but not so much to address the carbon problem. I mean, if you're worried about that, straight hybrids do almost as well. Uh, but uh, uh, plug electric hybrids, as you start to decarbonize the electricity system, may be an important part of getting ourselves weaned off of imported oil. So we got asked for one piece of advice for the new administration, and I've been told I'm not supposed to give it until the very end. But since John violated the rule, I will too. 
We need to stop thinking and talking and start investing and putting people to work developing new low-carbon energy technology. For example, if we don't stop talking and start building some commercial-scale CCS plants, carbon capture and sequestration plants, the technology transfer that a lot of people have talked about being from the U.S. to China is going to be in the other direction because there's lots of folks in China actively, aggressively developing this stuff, and they're going to get way down the learning curve before we even get started. They're going to know how to do it, and we won't. And if we don't get really serious about research on batteries, renewables and hybrids may never see their full potential. If we don't get serious about improving dramatically the energy efficiency of new buildings, we'll condemn ourselves to another 50 to 80 years of much higher energy use, continued CO2 emissions, and continued dependence on imported oil and gas. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Granger Morgan. And actually, it's not that you can't have any recommendations or advice for the president, but at the very end, you get a final last word. In case you weren't listening to me, here's my final piece of advice. Well, we've heard from uh, engineering, and now it's time to hear from economics. Lee Branstetter is Associate Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University's H. John Hines III School of Public Policy and Management. He came to the Hines School in 2006 from the Columbia Business School, where he was the Daniel Statton Associate Professor of Business and Director of the International Business Program. Dr. Branstetter's research interests include international economics, the economics of technological innovation, industrial organization, East Asian Economic Group, and the Japanese economy. He's an associate editor of the Journal of International Economics and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Among his other courses at the Heinz School, he teaches the economics of global warming. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Bronstetter. Well, uh, I, I'm very glad that John Holdren in his remarks noted that perhaps the most important thing we can do to address the global warming problem is to put a price on greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'm going to talk about how that can happen in the context of a cap-and-trade system. But before I get into that, I want to take just one minute to acknowledge the memory and legacy of a Heinz family member who served on the faculty of the Heinz School for several years before illness tragically claimed her life. Professor Penny Ferreira was passionately devoted to educating high school students about environmental issues in general and this issue of climate change in particular. Now, she's no longer with us, but we at the Heinz School have not forgotten the causes to which she was so deeply devoted in her life. And our engagement in this panel, our efforts to build new courses in this area, and our growing presence in D.C. are all part of our efforts to ensure that her passion and her vision gets tra get transmitted, not just to the current generation of high school students, but those who will follow after them. Uh, we will never forget uh, Professor Penny Ferreira. Her legacy at the Heinz School lives on. Now, I'm here as an economist, and I want to tell you that the global warming problem is a classic example of market failure. And here's how the market fails. When we engage in activities that emit greenhouse gases, we're contributing to a growing atmospheric stock of greenhouse gases that will, if unchecked, eventually cause tens of trillions of dollars of economic damages around the world. But the price we pay today for the emitting activities we engage in does not reflect the future cost of this environmental damage. Now, in a market system, people and firms respond to prices. We need to intervene in the market in a way that forces people to pay a price for the environmental damage they cause, and a cap-and-trade system is one way to do that. Now, under a cap-and-trade system, the government sets an overall target of greenhouse gas emissions for the economy at a point in time. This is the cap, the total level of permitted greenhouse gas emissions. Then the government distributes the right to emit bits of this national total to firms in the form of emissions permits and allows firms to trade these permits among themselves. 
Firms with fewer emissions than expected can effectively sell their excess permits to firms that are generating more emissions than they have permits. And the price at which these permits trade will effectively impose a price on emissions. Now, initially, this price is imposed on firms, of course, but it gets passed on to consumers so that everyone has to pay a price for the environmental damage they cause, and that gives them an economic incentive to minimize the damage. Now, over time, the government steadily tightens the cap. It lowers the total amount of permitted emissions, and this causes the price, this causes the price of emission permits to rise, hopefully in a steady, predictable way. People pay a higher and higher price for emissions, and the economic incentives to reduce emissions get steadily stronger. Now, economists like cap-and-trade systems because they allow firms a great deal of flexibility in responding to these incentives. Economists speak of this flexibility in terms of how flexibility where flexibility, and when flexibility. How flexibility refers to the fact that firms have the freedom to lower emissions however they can achieve them most cheaply. I mean, at some level, we really don't care how the emissions are achieved so long as they are achieved, and firms can respond to these incentives by adopting new technology, or they can use existing technology more carefully, or they can change the business they're in. Now, in contrast, forcing all firms to reduce emissions by adopting a particular technological approach could be quite costly for some firms. Now let's talk about where flexibility. Some firms and industries in the economy will be able to reduce their emissions more cheaply than others. As caps tighten and permit prices rise, firms that can reduce emissions cheaply and efficiently get a greater and greater cost advantage over firms that cannot, because firms that cannot have to keep on buying lots of expensive permits. Now this gives low emission firms an incentive to reduce their emissions as much as they can so they maximize their cost advantage. And as that cost advantage gets bigger, the low emission firms tend to dominate their industries, slowly squeezing out the high emission guys. Now with cap and trade, we don't have to hope that our government is smart enough to figure out where the low cost emissions reduction opportunities are. The market will find it for us and concentrate emissions reductions in the firms and industries where they can be reduced most cheaply and efficiently. Now this where flexibility is considerably limited if we have a cap and trade system that covers only part of the economy. Let's say you impose a cap and trade style regulation on electric power generation, but ignore the rest of the economy. Well, as you tighten caps, emissions reductions will tend to be concentrated in the electric power plants that can do it more cheaply. But your search for relatively cheap emissions reductions opportunities is limited to just one sector. You could be missing a lot. The most efficient power plant in the country may still find it more costly to reduce emissions than that widget factory in Kansas, but you've cut off your ability to shift the emissions reduction burden to that widget factory. So to maximize wear flexibility, you need to cover as much of the economy as possible. And of course, if the cap and trade system covers not just one country, but dozens of countries, then the opportunities for finding relatively inexpensive ways of reducing total emissions probably goes up even further. Most economists would see a US-only cap-and-trade system as a stepping stone toward a system that would include multiple countries, thereby maximizing the where flexibility in the system. And then there's when flexibility. We obviously want to start reducing emissions very soon, and we need to start reducing emissions very soon. But if emissions could be reduced next year much more cheaply than they can be reduced this year, then we would probably want to shift some of our reductions to next year. Now, sophisticated cap-and-trade systems provide for flexibility over time. They allow firms to bank excess emissions permits today for future use or borrow them from future, al future allocations, repaying these loans with interest. But even without this feature, firms have a choice of paying for, form for, for permits in the short run if it's too costly to change their business practices, but investing in abatement technologies in the longer run so that they don't have to keep buying so many expensive permits. And this flexibility in adjustment over time can be extremely important. Today, almost everything about our economy is optimized for an emission price of zero. Because we've not tried to price in the environmental damage our emissions create, our cars are too big, our houses are insufficiently insulated, and the list goes on. Now, if we tried to force the economy to become totally efficient overnight, we'd impose immense costs on the economy, and giving ourselves a little bit of time can lower the cost a lot. But this is not just an adjustment cost argument. If firms know that caps will tighten and permits will become steadily more expensive, then they will start investing a lot in green technologies, and the technologies that will be available to reduce emissions tomorrow are likely to be much better than the technologies that we have available today, further lowering the economic costs of, trans of transition to a low-carbon economy. Now, the how, where, and when flexibility of a cap-and-trade system confers an important advantage, at least in theory, over traditional methods of environmental regulation. 
it can be tempting for governments to try to reduce emissions by forcing businesses or customers to adopt, or consumers to adopt certain technologies, products, or practices. And sometimes this can work, uh, but it can also dramatically raise the economic costs of reducing emissions in some contexts. Now, let me give you an illustrative example. It's not meant to be uh, you know, necessarily accurate, but illustrative. Let's say that we pass a new law that requires that every new car sold in America has to get at least 50 miles to the gallon. Now, at one level, this would be good for the climate as well as good for saving gas because the less fuel a car burns per mile, the less CO2 it adds to the atmosphere per mile. So that sounds pretty good, right? But wait a minute. The new cars get 50 miles per gallon, but these new cars could be very expensive. Too expensive for some families in America to afford. So this policy actually gives less affluent Americans a strong incentive to hold on to their old gas guzzlers as long as possible. Even if the new cars get very good gas mileage, the average gas mileage of the national vehicle fleet could stay pretty low, perhaps for a very long time. And the new regulations would not give drivers of cars, new or old, any incentive to drive their cars less. If average miles per gallon goes up, but average vehicles per car per year go up even more, if everyone drives their cars a lot more, then emissions go up and not down. And finally, a sky-high mileage standard for cars does nothing to limit emissions generated by electricity plants or construction companies. It ignores the roughly 75% of greenhouse gas emissions generated outside the transportation sector. Now, this is a somewhat artificial example, but it illustrates a real problem. According to one study undertaken by Resources for the Future, using sector-specific technology mandates, like fuel efficiency standards for new cars, to reduce emissions instead of an economy-wide cap-and-trade program, could raise the economic costs of reducing those emissions by a factor of 10. A factor of 10. And this report isn't coming from lobbyists for the auto industry. Resources for the Future is perhaps the most respected environmental think tank in DC, if not the world. So for all these reasons, cap and trade seems like a reasonable place to start if we want to get serious about climate change. But getting it to work well requires that we get the details right. First, we need a cap and trade system that covers as much of the greenhouse gas emitting economy as possible. There'll be a strong political push to exempt industries from the system, and we need to resist those efforts. Second, we need a cap and trade system with a safety valve. Now, what do I mean? Well, let's say that we have a really cold winter, which requires us to heat our houses more than normal, followed by a really hot summer, which requires us to air condition our houses more than normal. And in the midst of this, we have an unanticipated, econo unanticipated economic boom. Well, demand for energy is going to go up relative to everyone's forecasts. And to meet all this demand for energy use, companies throughout the economy will be competing for a limited number of permits, to a much greater degree than they or the government anticipated. The price of these permits could go way, way up very, very quickly. Energy-intensive industries would struggle to deal with a sharp spike in permit prices, and in the short run, the only feasible response might be to lay off workers and curtail operations. And if our energy-intensive industries are competing with industries overseas that do not face a similarly rising carbon price, then they may lose market share. Now, this is where the safety valve kicks in. If the price of permits spikes, then a price ceiling kicks in and firms are able to buy as many permits as they need at that ceiling price. Now the downside is that actual emissions could exceed the cap under extraordinary circumstances, but it prevents permit prices from spiking and then collapsing in the next year. And if we want strong, stable incentives for businesses to invest in green technology, then we need to limit permit price volatility. A safety valve helps accomplish that. Third, we need a cap-and-trade system which moves towards auctioning off permits to the highest bidder as quickly as possible. Most existing cap-and-trade systems have handed permits to regulated firms for free. Now, this cushions the negative impact of the cap on emitting industries, but even with fairly modest caps, the market value of emissions permits in the U.S. could be worth tens of billions of dollars per year. And it's definitely not economically optimal in the long run to keep giving away an asset this valuable to emitting industries for nothing. By auctioning off permits to the highest bidder, the government could raise significant amounts of, ta of tax revenue, and you could use this revenue to reduce other taxes, to compensate vulnerable households, or invest in green technologies, or you could do some of all three. Most economists would strongly recommend an allocation system that moves to 100% auctions as quickly as politically possible. Now, is a cap and trade system enough by itself to achieve meaningful reductions in U.S. emissions? Probably not. Economic research suggests that the free market will invest way too little in basic research, even if we have assigned a price to emissions. Now, if we're going to solve the global warming problem, we're going to need much better green technology. So there is a very strong case for aggressive government investment 
and basic R&D on new climate-friendly technologies, and some of that investment could be funded by permit auctions. And in some cases, other approaches, such as technical standards, may be justified as a complement to cap and trade, but not as a, sub a substitute. Okay, well, um, you know, fortunately, I'm reasonably confident that a cap and trade system will be introduced in the next administration because uh, when Senator John McCain introduced his cap and trade bill, he had as a supporter Barack Obama. Thank you, Lee. Thanks very much. Dr. Lee Brandstetter. Melissa Mickey Young is a second year student in the Heinz School's Master of Science in Public Policy and Management program. Ms. Young has worked for various environmental organizations, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, where she assisted in the development of environmental sustainability criteria in the Office of Site Remediation Enforcement, Program Evaluation and Coordination. She earned her undergraduate degree in environmental science and policy, graduating magna cum laude from the University of Florida. I certainly was looking forward to your remarks, but after John's introduction, I'm really excited. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mickey Young. Well... Time is limited, so unfortunately I won't be able to cover all that they made me out to be, but um, <laughs> I'd like to start out uh, with a reality check. The next president inherits a, an extensive list of challenges when he takes office in January. National se security is an issue. We're fighting two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The tarnished public opinion of America abroad is impacting our international relations. The volatility of food and energy prices puts pressure on American households and has a destabilizing effect on the developing world. We're experiencing an epidemic of obesity and malnutrition, and pollution has become so ubiquitous throughout our environment that multiple dangerous chemicals can now be detected in nearly every American's bloodstream, even in baby's umbilical cord blood. And this is just part of the short list. Still, global warming, global climate change, is the most overwhelming of our challenges. But this threat can also be seen as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to reinvigorate our economy, make us more competitive in the global market, and at the same time improve our image as a leader worldwide. The threat of global climate change can provide the impetus for the next industrial revolution, the green revolution that's based on innovations in the realm of green energy, alternative energy, green building, smart planning and land use, and life cycle product design. I want to focus briefly on one piece of the green revolution, alternative energy. Two of the most promising prospects for renewable energy are wind and solar, because they're both widely available and they have the potential capacity to satisfy our current and future energy needs. The main barriers to wind and solar energy are related to their intermittent nature and the prohibitive costs as compared to fossil fuels. But government can help overcome these problems in ways that go beyond subsidizing the costs of inadequate technologies. An example of the type of government action necessary to fight global climate change through innovation was when President Clinton in the year 2000 devoted $227 million to the National Nanotechnology Initiative to fund research in nano-enabled technologies. The fruits of this investment are growing right here in this building, the Mellon Institute, where the chemistry department is home to cutting edge research in green chemistry and solar technology and energy storage. This relatively small investment from the government has propelled such progress in this area that now we're able to think not only about energy independence as a nation, but even the possibility of energy independence for every household. 
The technology is so promising that several spin-off companies have been founded. One great example is Plextronic, which is a world leader in the development of plastic solar cells. So my point here is that if we keep at this work, and if government helps fund innovation, we can develop renewable energy technologies that are safe, simple, and affordable. And in the process, not only will we save ourselves, but there's the chance, if we hurry, that emerging economies will be able to advance their development without the use of short-sighted energy strategies like burning rainforests. But I'd like to reiterate that while alternative energy is crucial, there's a multitude of other potential solutions that we need to undertake simultaneously, like cap and trade, cutting our energy demand through conservation and performance standards, improved efficiency, carbon sequestration, and whatever else we can come up with that will help restore the balance to our national car to our natural carbon cycle and slow down that spigot that Dr. Morgan was talking about, and relieve the pressure in that bathtub. So my advice to the next president is to remember that this is our opportunity to change the United States and the world for the better. It's his duty and responsibility to act now and to act boldly, and not just to do something, but to do everything we can. Thank you. Now, thank you, Mickey. Now, we are going to be taking questions, and there's two microphones out in the audience. So if you wave your hand, we will, we will get those to you. And while we're waiting for the first one, I'm going to kick us off with Granger. I have a, I have a, uh, a question for you in the engineering side. Uh, we've been for decades, sort of since the age of electricity, first we're going to build something and we get all excited and say, where are we going to get the power? You know, it's like, well, are we going to plug it in? We're going to get a battery. Very much like we're going to get the energy somewhere. And uh, a young engineering student asked me the other day, well, how should I think differently? And I said, well, for starters, you know, if you're sitting in the sun, you'd better be a power generator. You know, it's like blacktop buildings, you go on and on. I said, just start thinking about generating power from an or orientation standpoint as opposed to what are you going to get to drive what you're building. From an engineering standpoint, what changes in mindset do we need to teach the engineers that are coming along? Well, we need to uh, get them thinking about innovation. And as a matter of fact, the Dean of Engineering is about to put together a, a, a study group here at Carnegie Mellon to figure out how we get our engineering undergraduates uh, thinking more about developing innovative uh, technologies because while uh, uh, the sorts of cap and trade strategies that uh, Lee talked about will uh, uh, presumably provide some market forces without uh, somebody out there figuring out uh, the new technologies that uh, will respond, uh, you know, we're not going to get there. We need also, of course, uh, substantially increased resources for the development of these new technologies. A little later on, Lee and I may have a bit of an argument over whether cap and trade is the right, uh, is the only strategy to adopt, but I'll uh, save that for later. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> First question? We have, great, when you have a, there we go, right, right over here. Was the Kyoto uh, a missed opportunity, Kyoto? Should we have signed, could you hear that? Was the Kyoto Accord when we were negotiating worldwide, was that a lost opportunity? Was that something we should have signed? What would have changed to enable us to go along with it? Should we have signed the Kyoto Accords? I signed the Kyoto Accords. What? Should we have, Should we have signed the Kyoto Accords? Do you want to? Well, <laughs> number one. We just got a little technology burp here. Actually, we, we did sign the Kyoto Agreement. We just failed to ratify it. And, and um, in, in, in my opinion, we should have ratified it. 
notwithstanding its flaws, and we should have then worked to, move, to, to fix those flaws as we moved ahead. We should have tried to fix it on the fly rather than forgetting it, which was the strategy uh, of the Bush administration. Uh, nonetheless, I think at this point the Kyoto uh, Accord is basically uh, moot. That is, uh, most of the countries that agreed to targets are not going to meet them. There was never any agreement on what the penalty would be for failing to meet the targets. I think one of the ways we should have fixed it would, to have, would have been to agree that the penalty for failing to meet your target would be to increase your investments in low emitting technologies and measures in proportion to the amount by which you fail to meet the target in the preceding period so that the punishment would fit the crime, as it were, and would lead to a remedy. We didn't do any of that. We just walked away from it, and it was a big blow, our walking away from it, to uh, the world's attempt to make uh, a cooperative approach to this particular problem. Uh, nonetheless, the question now is what we should do uh, when the Kyoto uh, Accord expires in 2012, what we need to do going forward. And I think uh, there is real hope that with a new administration coming in in early 2009, we will become full participants in the process of deciding how to move forward from 2012 in a way that will get the world on a trajectory uh, of emissions declining after 2020. Granger. About a dozen years ago, I wrote an editorial in the journal Science uh, called Managing Carbon from the Bottom Up, which said it's perfectly fine to be working on trying to develop a single global regime to which everyone will then agree and, and get on board, but that it's very unlikely that, that any such agreement reached now is going to be terribly binding, that what we really need is to get a bunch of countries getting serious about this problem, and we ought to divert at least a little bit of the international negotiation to figuring out how to merge a variety of, of evolving strategies when, you know, the U.S. does one thing and the Europeans do another and so on, to hold out the argument that we're not going to do anything until we've all gotten on board with a single global regime, I think would be a mistake. You look like you want to say something, Lee. Just a quick, quick proscript out of that. I mean, I, I very much agree with uh, Granger's uh, position. And in fact, you don't necessarily need a, a universal or a global agreement um, or coordination to make substantive progress. A number of prom proposals have been made in recent years, including some by David Victor, uh, for a focused group of countries, including the largest developing countries, that can meet together to talk seriously about climate change reduction. If you have something that involves a very large number of countries, it can be very difficult to come up with a deeply meaningful agreement. Smaller numbers of the right countries uh, could make substantive progress even in the absence of that. The next question's up here. Wave your hands, we can get a microphone, okay. get set up for the next one. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Brunstetter, you were talking about uh, a safety valve associated with a cap and trade. And uh, one of the things that uh, Tom Friedman was talking about when gas was at $4 and a gallon three or four weeks ago, it seems, was uh, present, uh, having a program in place that would uh, keep $4 as a minimum price for gasoline. I was just wondering if that kind of negative safety valve also fits into uh, the kind of system that you envision. Uh, and in fact, oh sorry, and, and in fact there are uh, proposals that have been debated in Congress suggesting the creation of what we might call a carbon fed, a government agency that would actually intervene in the permit market to regulate the prices of permits so that they don't go too high but that they don't go too low. It would operate a little bit like Ben Bernanke in monetary policy. If the price drops too low, the carbon fed steps in and buys up permits until you get the price back up to the desired level to produce strong incentives for emissions mitigation, and if the price spikes, then you have, uh, you know, a, a, a carbon Bernanke uh, intervening to try and mitigate some of those short-run impacts on industry. So why don't we uh, start our interaction on this subject? <laughs> well, Granger, I, I, I see a lot more questions out yeah, there in the well, audience. <laughs> so, so we'll take another question in a moment. But, 
Carbon taxes are great. I have no problem with them. The difficulty is it's a slow and laborious process. And there are, is a lot to be said for performance standards that then allow some trading. You could do this on a sectoral basis. You could say, you know, every wires company, every power company that sells electricity to an end customer must produce power that is at or below some carbon intensity, or they need to buy credits, or they need to invest in developing that technology. CAFE standards have worked pretty well in the past for getting uh, more efficient motor vehicles on the road. And the effect of the sorts of carbon prices that are, people are now talking about in the U.S. as politically viable will have almost no effect on the driving and auto choices of Americans. And so while I got no problem with implementing a cafe, I mean a, a, a cap and trade system, I also think some sectorally specific technologies or approaches to, to push technology in these couple of sectors where we know there's an enormous problem, uh, could be a much faster route. Now, John, I don't know if you have any views on this or not. Well, I agree, uh, and I tried to mention this in my talk, but I went by it too quickly when I was listing the ingredients of a strategy at the end. I said, we need to put a price on carbon, but we need to supplement it with measures in particular sectors that are intractable uh, in terms of how high the carbon price has to get before they would be adequately responsive, and the vehicle sector is one of those, and coal burning power generation is another, where we're not going to get a carbon price plausibly in the next 15 years that's high enough to motivate CO2 capture and sequestration at coal burning power plants. We need, we, we, we need to take, yeah, we, 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 need, we need to take additional measures to get that done. You know, I just want to say before we go to this question, the other thing we want to add into that is that I speak with graduate students all the time, and I remember when I was in science and engineering in graduate school, and people were like really interested in the science or interested in the engineering, and I have to say, almost to a person, they, they say they got into it because they really want to change the world. They really want to solve a lot of these problems. And that motivation is more than uh, cap and tax and money and economics, and it's more than just coming up with new uh, innovation because we love the science and engineering, but there is an entire generation of people out there right now who are totally motivated just to solve these kinds of problems, and I think that's very heartening. Now we have another question here. What are the relative merits of cap and trade versus like a flat carbon tax that I also hear mentioned? Economists like carbon taxes um, for the most part. Um, we like them because uh, they tend to stabilize the cost uh, that's associated with a given level of emissions. Um, and what we want to do is have a cost that rises over time in a stable and predictable way that's going to give strong incentives to the economic system and the R&D system uh, to work on this uh, mitigation problem. Um, but uh, taxes, uh, carbon taxes are taxes. Right? So you recall the debates last Wednesday night, right? I mean, one of the things that Obama said that surely uh, people who aren't planning to vote for him can agree with is that nobody likes paying taxes. Uh, and I think there is some issue in terms of the political saleability of a carbon tax as opposed to a cap and trade. But here's the thing. You can get a lot of the potential flexibility offered by a carbon tax in a cap and trade system if you get the design features right. right? A carbon tax generates revenue. And that could be used to do good things, like promote green R&D. Well, if you auction the permits in a cap-and-trade system, you get the revenue. Right? A carbon tax stabilizes the price of a unit of GHG emissions. Well, if you have a carbon fed or a safety valve on the upside and a price floor on the downside, you can stabilize those prices in the context of a cap-and-trade system. And the other thing that you can build into a cap-and-trade system that would be harder to incorporate into a carbon tax would be credits for things like carbon sequestration technologies. Um, so I, would have, I have come around to seeing you know, the carbon tax and the cap and trade system as being points on a continuum of potential policy movements. And as long as we get to some point on the continuum, that's within a reasonable range. Uh, I think it'll be a vast improvement over what currently exists. Hey. I've been passed a question for Mickey. Uh, Mickey, someone would like you to discuss the blog. There was a student blog, right, Mickey? There should be one right there. There we go. 
Okay. Discuss the... The blog. Okay, well, there's been uh, some discussion about um, whether the economy has overtaken the, the issue of global warming in this presidential election and uh, whether the political interest is there to deal with it anymore now that people's pocketbooks are their largest concern. I don't really have the answer. I mean, like I said, the economy and the housing crisis and the financial system collapse is all at the front of our minds right now, but this is a problem that's not going to go away, and it is something that uh, the next president is going to have to deal with, and I think it's still a factor in the way people are going to vote in the election. Right here. I'm not convinced that uh, carbon sequestration has been anywhere close to being proven. The coal companies want us to believe that this is going to really work well. And uh, from what I understand, it's both very expensive and very difficult to do. And uh, I've heard a couple plants, experimental plants have closed. Is that true? I mean, do we really have something here that's going to work? Or is this just uh, uh, some... Uh, propaganda to keep the coal industry in this. Okay. Well, That's our last question. I'll start, and John may want to add. First, first, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change did a very thorough look at this technology. This is the same group that has met uh, three times now to produce these, uh, these uh, extensive reviews of climate science and its impacts. And uh, actually, uh, a member of my faculty was asked to write the technical summary for that report. The answer is this technology will work, and though it won't be extraordinarily expensive, but it will require carbon prices up around $40 a ton of CO2 or more, and at the moment the political discussions are, oh, we can't possibly have carbon prices above about 12 or $15 a ton because it's politically unacceptable. So there is that problem. Um, the issue is that all the technology exists today at commercial scale. So, I mean, for example, the, the way that we get uh, uh, carbon dioxide for our Coke and Pepsi is by scrubbing CO2 out of the exhaust streams of power plants. We have gasification systems. Now, they're not being used for this purpose, but there are hundreds of these things running all around the world in the chemical industry. Eastman Chemical uh, in Kentucky has a couple of them running. They've been running for years. And we got a lot of locations around, oh, we have locations around the world where there is CO2 being injected deep underground. When I said a lot, most of them are pretty small, but there are some that are comparable in scale. For example, off the coast of Norway, uh, in the uh, Schleipner field, uh, there's a natural gas uh, reservoir. Natural gas often comes with CO2 intermixed. They're separating the CO2 and re-injecting it deep under the seabed. The same is going on in a BP project in Algeria. All the pieces exist. But the problem is we've got to start actually doing this so we can start down the learning curve. Because if we don't, there are others around who are going to do it first. I mean, as I was joking to uh, John earlier, the... the um, images that we're going to develop the technology and then solve China's coal problem by handing it to them, I'm increasingly thinking the technology transfer may be in the opposite direction. Great. Did you have something you want to add to that, Lee? Um, well, maybe I could just briefly rejoin uh, the debate, given what my uh, colleague said about, uh, about standards. So, I, you know, look, I, you know, um, at one level, if we can all agree that a cap-and-trade system is a good place to start, I'm inclined to just declare victory and move on. But <laughs> the, the discussion that you know, a price of $40 a ton is, is politically infeasible, but that alternative strategies which might actually have higher costs are feasible because the costs are less evident or transparent um, is something that... Um, 
you know, some economists would, would take exception to. Now, I realize that the exact cost calculations depend on one's assumptions. They depend on the model, and we don't really know at this point what they will cost. But I think the reality is that whatever we do, um, it's going to cost us something as a society. Um, and the question of whether we as a society will be willing to pay those costs is ultimately not an economic question. It's almost a philosophical question. And that question is not ultimately going to be answered by us. It's going to be answered by you. Right? I mean, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said to our grandparents' generation, your generation has a rendezvous with destiny. Well, so does this generation. So choose well. Now, so, uh, so just a quick comment. It, it'll be... <laughs> Two, I was two, hoping you'd say something. Two, two sentences. Uh, wind, nuclear, uh, are two examples of carbon-free generation that will be about the same price as CCS. And so, yeah, it takes about $40 a ton to get there. But we're already putting in lots of wind around, and we're subsidizing it to do it. But, uh, you know half or so of our electricity comes from coal. I don't know how to get there from here without using this technology. Well, two weeks from tomorrow is the is election day, and we will have a new president-elect. And so I've arranged for each of you to be able to speak in the president-elect's ear for just, you know, 30, 40, 50 seconds, you know, under a minute. Uh, one big idea, one single idea that you want this president-elect to hear. I'm going to start with you, Mickey. Well, the big idea is that there is no single solution, and then it's going to take a holistic, multifaceted approach, and we need to do something right now, not just something, but but everything, get the wheels moving and really take this issue seriously. Thank you. Lee. Well, it's probably no surprise. Cap and trade. <laughs> but the right cap and trade. Okay, that's the right place to start. And there's going to be a heck of a political fight to get there. We want to avoid pushes to exempt industries. Right? We want to avoid the push to have free allocation forever. And I think it would be useful to have a safety valve or a carbon fix. Right. Granger. Well, we've got a mess in the economy, and one way to work our way out of it is to start building stuff and hiring people to do it. Before you start spending money, you need to talk with folks who've done some careful analysis. You don't want to waste money. But there's a lot of things we could start doing now that involve putting concrete in the ground and bending steel, and we need to start. John. <laughs> My advice would be very similar uh, to Granger's. The key point I would make is that although the economy must now be very high on the national agenda, the link between the energy issue, the climate issue, and the economy is an intense one. And the fact is the risks to our economy are far greater from neglecting the climate problem than from solving it. If we solve the climate problem, we will actually reap a variety of economic benefits, including new jobs, new technology, a redirection of some economic activity far more than a loss of economic activity, and we will avoid immense economic damages which we face from the failure to address the climate problem. Well, I'm a little shocked myself to realize that I, oh, please, applause, it's always welcome. <laughs> Well, I, I'm a little, while I was scheduling those little, little, little blurbs into the president-elect's ear, I actually scheduled one for myself, and I'm a little surprised to be saying, paraphrasing Muhammad Ali to the president-elect, but he always said, you need, I can't do it like he did, or does, <laughs> but you need more than the skill, you got to have the will. And that's, that's really where we are. Now, before we have, before we, I have a few announcements, but before that, first of all, let me thank my panelists, Dr. John Holmgren, Dr. Granger Morgan, Dr. Lee Brandstetter, and Mickey Young. Let us thank... Let us also thank Teresa Hines, the Hines Award, John Hines III School of Public Policy and Ma Management, and of course, Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> and
And as for the announcements, there are two. Number one, please join us for a reception immediately afterward. And number two, with the last person out, please not forget to turn off the lights. Thank you very much. Thank you.